this is one of our big issue big topic webinars and this week it's talk data to me and i'm delighted to introduce erica marks and carolyn silfon to take us through over to you okay hi everybody i'm going to uh, i'm doing the tech and doing a little introduction sharing control well not sharing the tech controls with carolyn because she's like hundreds of miles away um, but sharing this presentation there's going to be three of us there's myself there's carolyn and then nancy watt is coming on at the top of the hour so we have 90 minutes and that and the order of things is going to be so this this webinar is a recreation to some extent of a session that the three of us did at the AIN conference in 2019 in Stony Brook and luckily our session was like Friday morning or something when we all were fully alert <laughs> because by the end of the conference we were like kind of going to activities that didn't involve words but at the very beginning we're back <laughs> and the way it's what we're going to do is Carolyn's going to first introduce about just science and how to approach how to connect science to the type of work we do and things to be keeping in mind then I'm going to come in for a little bit about thinking about how to work with your client and how what kind of questions to be asking to get the bigger context of why are we doing this work and how do we measure success in the large picture then we're back to Carolyn and she's going to we're going to have about 20 minutes on creating learning objectives for your sessions that you can get good data from that you can measure how to tighten that up we're going to send you into breakout rooms after she orients us so everyone will have five minutes or so in a breakout room um, to workshop your session a little bit based on what she said then I am part two which is collecting real-time data in the room so interactive ways to collect data and have it be meaningful to your clients while you're running your session and then again we'll send you into breakout rooms to talk about how maybe you could incorporate those tools or something else and come back and then Nancy Watt should be coming on the call at the top of the hour and she's going to do a section on appreciating bias, like understanding how does bias come in and how does that, how do we work with these messy humans that we are, what to keep in mind. And then she's going to send you into breakout, I'm going to send you into breakout rooms again. And then we'll wrap up with a group discussion. That oh, is geez. the plan. <laughs> so, uh, feel free surveys, to, no. yes. Feel free to yep. interact with us throughout. Yep. Yes, we're trying to build in this, and of course, we have all this um, planned for you. So, let's see. What else do I want to say? This is being recorded. We hit that button, and we have a feedback survey at the end. So, we'll have a new link at the end. And many of you completed the survey at the beginning, which is a recreation of the part of the worksheet that we used in that session to help you get thinking about your, about your session. Okay, Carolyn, I am turning it over. And do we, to do we you. have anyone who was at our session or are we all new? Cool. I, okay. Um, I'm going so to are, put, are we gonna are we yeah, gonna do I'm, this with slides or without slides? Well, I guess while we're while we're getting that together. You've got yeah, slides so I, right now, Carolyn. So I'm relatively new to the AIN community. I'm a physics professor. That's my background. I'm very passionate about education. And uh, my hope as we enter into the next decade is that we, and by we, I mean as 7 billion people, can learn to make better decisions grounded in, grounded in both compassion and compassion evidence. And evidence. I, I've been really impressed with what I've seen with applied improv in terms of developing compassion. Uh, and then the other, uh, the other piece, and we can, yeah, we can go to the, to the Feynman slide. Uh, is how we can ground what we do in evidence as well. And uh, the idea is our brains were naturally selected to survive, not to be correct, not to be accurate. And it's very easy for us to fool ourselves. And so we want to constantly be checking and testing and basing our decisions uh, in, in as close to reality as we can. And we can never exactly perceive reality perfectly, but we can get closer and closer 
to perceiving rea reality more and more accurately. And yeah, this is a quote by the late by the by a late great physicist uh, Richard Feynman. Uh, the test of all knowledge is experiment. So how do we do this? Typically, it's some sort of iterative cycle. You've all done this in your workshops, I'm sure, in a typical workshop. Uh, you observe something, you analyze something, you test your assumptions, and you test what you see. You test the model that you create based on your observations. Um, and so this is also the scientific process. And so how can we delve into this and make this more precise and and um, and use this to inform our work and uh, improve what we do. Um, since we are, in this case, we're dealing with education, with learning, with people, with emotions, uh, so we're gathering data about people. Whenever we're gathering data about people, we want to consider the ethical considerations behind it. Um, this community I know is extremely compassionate already. So it's more just how do we be mindful of things we might not even be aware of. Um, so be completely transparent if we are collecting data, how we might use that, how the data might be stored, um, ensure that participation is voluntary and that participants may withdraw at any time. Uh, so in the interest of that here, uh, we are collecting some data, right? We, you, you, most of you have filled out a form already, uh, and we will be using that data only to inform our own, the, the, to improve future workshops. So we will not be sharing that data for, from this webinar. Uh, and we, it will be stored on Google Drive, and you may use a pseudonym, as you have likely seen in the form. So please feel free to do that, and you may leave the webinar at any time. I see a poll. Okay, great. Let's see what happens. So the poll says, do you use tools to measure the results of your sections? So here are, here are the non-existent results that you can probably see now. Oh, no, so, those are, those, we, I see results. Really? They all say zero to me. It says so, yes, let's, let's, 38%, no, 38%, other 25%. All right. Well, the leader, the emperor, the leader here has no idea what's going on. So I see zero for everything. I'm going to close huh. this. Um, stop sharing. There we go. So the second question is that you can answer in the chat is what tools do you use? So if you answered yes, the use tools, go ahead and just type in the chat what tools. And I know you did this on the survey where ju we just got that. Right? Yes. So this way we can share with everybody. So it looks like the answers that came in on the poll, according to Doug, who reported them here, were 38% yes, 38% no, and 25% other. Right. And I'm reading these because I believe in the recording, you won't see the chat. So what I'm seeing coming in is a single post workshop survey form, sometimes smile sheets which means like at the end, everyone's like, did you like it? Yes, I did. Yes, it was great. A few questions for qualitative info, some scales sometimes. I use Google Forms with an A to 10 scale. Maybe one ten. Evaluation from the participants one on what ten. the objectives of the sessions were. So from a one to 10 scale. So Google Forms afterwards. Some people are using things in the room. Some people are doing online. A lot of post survey things, post post session evaluations. Three qualitative questions. Three qualitative questions. All right. Do you have any any comments about that, Carolyn? Before we move into right, the next question. Like mostly what people are using thus far are our surveys to assess the results. Yes. So and. Um, and again, in the pre-survey, we've asked everyone to come. This is a working workshop, so we've asked everyone to come with a specific, uh, with a specific uh, thing in mind, a specific workshop in mind. Yeah, Over with you, a specific Erica. thing. So here is what to think. Here's my little piece about thinking about your specific workshop. So this is thinking about when you meet with your client, like you're doing a workshop and it's very easy to get focused on like my awesome workshop and is my workshop great and do they like it and just be in this narrow box. 
and that's that's important and we're going to spend time you know being able to answer that because we as facilitators and trainers obviously want to know are we immediately successful with the goals we set out with our individual workshop or our little training whatever training program we're doing and it is important to whoever's uh somebody's loud Can people please mute yeah. themselves melissa i think um yeah really? melissa mm -hmm. could you mute yourself um and it's easy and that's important right it's important to define your objectives for just success in that single three hour period or one day period or six week period and your client has hired you not to just be successful in your period but they have a goal right so when you meet with your client i like to map out three these three places like where are they now so what's going on in their business or their organization what's going on that has them having a conversation with you where do they want to be and how will they know they get there so maybe they want to increase sales or maybe they want to have their team of like have some organizational goals or some results they want to achieve as a team so what does that look like that may be a year out or two years out or five years out where do they want to be what's the bigger context and then an interesting question to also ask them is if things just keep going the way they're going and just what is your most probable future that you're living into so not um, not good or bad just like the most likely default future now the gap between their default future and where they want to be the bigger that gap is the more likely that they're looking for solutions and if your program is whatever's going to fit in that gap so that gap people are going to hire you if that gap is perceived to be big so either the pain of their default future or the greatness of where they want to be depends a little bit on the type of clients you work with, whether you're working in the space where people are trying to avoid a painful future or whether they're aspiring to a positive future. So you can lean into each of those questions to see which one is gonna be more um, motivating to your client. So this is, and, and the answers to how, you're, how they are going to know, I'm gonna stop the share, you get the idea of the, the like my, my cursor doesn't work on the screen. Ah, this is great. I love being this like tech show. All right, I think I'm back. Am I back? Can you guys see me? All right, <laughs> good. Um, so, what was I saying? So yeah, so those, the answers to like how your client defines success may not be measurements that you can measure, right? There are things that are internal to their own processes. There are things like retention or sales or, you know, there's things that are about them. So having that conversation so that you have those numbers or those qualitative measures to go back to with your client is an important part of the process. So I am asking in the chat, go ahead and type in, if you know, like how is your client when they look back and they say, wow, I'm so glad I brought in that consultant. What are the numbers or what are the measures that they're using to define success? So if anyone wants to type those in, uh, we'll read them to you. The bridge goes over the gap, bridge the gap. There's lots of bridge. <laughs> uh, okay, there's, a, there's, some, there's some feedback here about the language. Um, yes, your program is the bridge of the gap, or maybe it's the ladder, or maybe, it's, maybe the gap is the, I don't know. Yeah, You can use whatever language works for you. So let's see, did anyone type in I would say delta, you know, like the <laughs> difference. <laughs> use the but, client, yeah. use the language that works for your client is really what you do. Exactly. You listen to them and then maybe flip it to be a positive frame because that's part of our job to be professionals at looking for opportunity and creating opportunity. So this is a really, I, you know, whether people type in or not, this is a useful thing to take a note of to make sure you're having this conversation with your client. And it, that can be a big service to them to really dig in and ask them over and over again, right? Like, how are you going to know it's going to be successful? And then, and maybe to build in an evaluation, make sure that they're also evaluating how they're doing. So maybe they already have an annual survey. Maybe they already have things that they do. Make sure that, you know, just help them tighten up their own thinking about are they, 
are they paying attention to what really counts in their business and you're kind of helping them think that through and then it really gives you great information for designing your session yeah and we do have uh pain avoidance is one thing that has come up on the chat as, as something that pain avoidance on things like communications so uh, reducing pain on communication um and I would dig in more, right? Like, how do you know pain, communication pain has been reduced? You know, sometimes, like a, a client I just work with, they're like, I want less, she was the HR person. She's like, I want less people in my office. I want less conversations. They're like, okay, are you tracking those conversations? Like, can we turn that into something that, that you can keep track of so we can really know for sure in what way is, have we succeeded or not, or made a difference? Okay. Yeah, there's also there's how, how we show impact when the when the client's views are retentions, costs, revenues, and these are valuable to keep in mind as part of the bigger picture. So we can help bridge that uh, connection as well. Yeah, why do you want to have less conversations? So <laughs> David does. Yeah, like what keeps going? Like, uh, you know, why is that important? Why is that important? Why is that important? How will you know? What difference will it make? Like, you know, you're really helping them see and create the future they want in asking these questions. I'm, I'm curious um, what success people have had in tying to more measurable business results. I did have a client who said after we did a team alignment meeting, a two-day meeting, that there were fewer HR issues. And before I that, had, they were getting once exactly. a week. Exactly. Has anyone else had? Yeah, I had a hospital that I was working with, that I was proposing with. Their measure of success was that their nurses would be sedating their patients less. They wanted me to come do like help their nurses be better at dealing with empathy and better at dealing with conflict. And their measure of success is there would be less incidents of their nurses, the current way of dealing with patients was to sedate them. All right, so that was a very concrete, <laughs> intense uh, measure of success in the big picture. So, all right, I'm gonna turn it back over to Carolyn for- sure. Um, creating learning objectives. So we're, now we're going to go back to this. So, so it's good to keep that big picture in mind. Now we're going to go back, back to the smaller scale of our specific workshops. Um, and yeah, I see there is another academic in the house as well. Uh, so I do think of this in terms of learning goals, but these are training goals, however you want to think of them. Um, we want to be able to be very specific about what we want to do and then we will be better able to assess whether we achieve those goals. Now again, not there are goals on larger scales that we might not be able to get measurements for. We don't want to say those aren't valuable, but we there is a lot that we can measure and we want to be as scientific as we can about what we can be scientific about. Not that there's many valuable things that are beyond science. Um, and so the goals, in the, if you did the pre-survey, you thought a little bit about what are the goals for your session. We want to try to be very specific about these and think about and both direct measures of these goals and indirect measures. Uh, people thus far have used surveys, which tend to be an indirect measure we're trying to get at. You know, what did people actually learn? It can be really powerful to think about, can we actually measure what they learned? Can we actually measure the behavior that we're hoping to see? Um, so I'm giving an example from my experience. So we want to, we we shortly we will put you into breakout rooms and ask you to get very specific in terms of the participants will be able to do what after your workshop that they that they perhaps struggled with doing before. Um, so when I first think about this for my course, I think, oh, I want students to make meaning out of physics and mathematics, and most most of you are probably like, well, what, what does that mean, right? That's, that's very, very vague. Or we often think, oh, I want them to understand. I want them to communicate better. Um, and it's, th these are all glorious goals and vague. Um, and so how can we make this more specific? So um, the, uh, a more specific goal, like what do I really mean by that? Uh, oops, I mean to interpret, generate, and translate among multiple representations. So this is, you know, like, graphs, equations, words of phenomena in the physical world. So being able to, you know, watch a ball rolling down a ramp and translate among multiple different representations. And that's what I mean by making meaning out of this, to be able to describe it using multiple different ways and analyze it using multiple different tools. 
Um, and this is something that I could actually test, I could observe, right? Like I could give students a problem and be like, hey, can you actually represent the same physical phenomenon in multiple ways using diagrams, graphs, tables, words, equations? So I could get a direct measure of that goal. Sometimes it's hard to collect that data, so we often do use indirect measures as well. Uh, but the hope is to have something very specific that we could, in theory at least, collect direct data and see a change in behavior. Um, ideally, yeah, so the question came in on chat before and after. That would be ideal um, if we can do that. And so pre-surveys are great. That's, you might have noticed we kind of did that, right? Like, what are your goals? How do you state your goals before this webinar? How do you state your goals after this webinar? Um, so that's great, because that's one of the goals of our webinar meta at the meta level. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so it's great if you can do before and after, generally at least at the end, at least to be able to see, hey, by the end, are they, are they able to do this? But the best would be to, to see, is, is there any gain? Is there any growth in this ability? Um, so to help you uh, with this, I'm going to give you a link to some, so this link that I'm sending in is a bunch of verbs. So it's basically this, um, what we're showing you here. I find this is a very useful tool to try to be specific for the educators in the house. It's loosely based on Bloom's taxonomy. Um, to think in terms of how, what specifically do I want people to be able to do as a result? Uh, and to try to use very specific verbs and active verbs. So again, the prompt is, I'll put it into the chat, participants will be able to. And you're gonna wanna fill that in. And these are just some example verbs to help get the brainstorming process started. Um, and we're gonna put you into breakout rooms because this is often easier to do with a partner. Uh, you're going to have five minutes uh, to discuss your workshop. So you, you obviously introduce yourselves, share the workshop you're working on, um, your initial goal that you had in mind, and then try to help each other. In the meantime, I'm going to send you all into breakout rooms, which is another technological miracle that you're all going to appreciate. So I'm going to send you into breakout rooms so you can work on that. Like participants will be able to what? And get that into a nice concrete form. Yeah. You'll and have we'll that. Try to, yeah. And so copy that link at least because I'm not sure. The link might go away when you go into breakout rooms. So copy <laughs> that link. You will get access to it while you are in your breakout room. We promise. Um, and, uh, and the goal will be in five minutes, be able to tell to share in chat your partner's goal if you can all right you can send us a message in the breakout rooms by typing one in and sending it to all oh okay that does work yep five minutes they're enjoying yeah, their conversation yes that's the sign yeah they have seven seconds and they're going to get all booted in here well that's good to know <laughs> yes no. they love the full five minutes yep <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> so if you are willing to share your partner's goals in, uh, in the chat and we can read them out, or if you want to share them verbally, whichever you prefer. Uh, I'll start. Um, so I was with David and, uh, and you're welcome. <laughs> um, so um, David said that he's working with um, a uh, client experience uh, team with uh, with um, 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 a charity. It's like a charity over several states, and they work with patient experience to improve uh, empathy uh, uh, from the medical staff. And um, and the objective was that to to develop the empathy. Um, and actually, we didn't get the time to to get to to specifics, but. We actually came up with the idea that uh, co-creating that with the client and starting with what he wants to see improved and then turning this into observable, concrete, measurable, um, um, or behavioral kind of countable things would, would help. Cool. Great, and we have uh, Mark and Hugh. Uh, so we wanna know what are the, what are the goals? So the, the two do 
so the participants will be able to some examples of, of specific things that, that came out and we realized that might not have been long enough for everyone. It's, 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 we're trying to squeeze a lot into here. You know, some of the goals that I'm, I'm I have, it looks like I'll have the opportunity to work with a team over three months and kick off with a team alignment meeting and then uh, help them take their uh, creative playbook and then actually bring into fruition about how they work together. So, you know, one of the things they want to be able to do is openly uh, give and receive feedback, um, respond emotionally, intelligently to triggers and, you know, create psychological safety. Um, we will do some type of pre-work assessment. But some of those things are going to be interesting. I'm not sure how to measure how well people can openly give and receive feedback. I mean, we can mm -hmm. give them a, yeah. a we, scale. Yeah, we could, with, with more time, we could, dem we could brainstorm that. But we could, I think we can all individually imagine like improv games that involve giving and receiving feedback where we could actually see how well they do. It, hard to measure, but certainly test, certainly in theory testable directly. And certainly indirectly by yes. people self-assessing and or people reporting before and after. Lots of ways you could ask them or ask someone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, yeah. Well, it'll be a mixture of observable skill because ideally I'll be able to work with them in their meetings and of course assessments along the way. Well, I think it's a good segue um, mm -hmm. because I see David in here is about scale of one to 10, how psychologically safe do you feel on your team? So like you can ask scaling questions and that's a good segue to something I do often, different variations. I'm gonna show you two variations of using scaling questions in the room. So scaling questions, meaning you ask a question, you make a statement and people respond to like how strongly they agree or disagree. So you could think of that as a scale, like zero means I have, I don't, I completely disagree or I have no connection to this and 10 being, you know, I, I completely agree or I strongly feel aligned with this. And if you ask people in surveys, you know, they'll give you numbers. But one thing I like to do is do something that gets it in the room and in people's bodies. So if you, if you designate, oh, um, let me see if I have slides maybe. The first, the first thing I'm gonna, the first method of doing this I'm gonna show you is perhaps the most complicated. <laughs> so, and it has the benefit of allowing people to answer in a way that they get to physically feel what's the right answer for them. And their data is anonymized in the, in the room so that if you're asking a sensitive question, like how psychologically safe do you feel on your team? By definition, if you're asking that question and someone does not feel like they can be truly honest on that team, and you're trying to ask it live in the room, you're not going to get honest answers, right? And you're also going to be putting your participants on the spot in a way that is violating the trust that they're giving you as their facilitator. So this is a way to ask these more sensitive questions to allow people to use their bodies and to protect the anonymity, and it becomes an empathy exercise. Let me see. Uh, if I have slides that are going to be specifically helpful for this. So this, I'm gonna give you an example of a way I ran this exercise for Lewis Wells, for, who is at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. And he just started recently launched the New Jersey Institute of Technology Center for Applied Improv and Theater at their, at their campus. And they had me come in and he wanted me to do a talk on confidence but also about, they have a very diverse community, also about inclusion and people feeling like they belong. So it was like a, um, and so I, I created this talk or this workshop and my way of framing it was that your sense of confidence is a co-creation between what you're giving out in the world and then the reply you're getting back from the system that you're in. So the first work being to the first context to set the frame for how do you improve your confidence or how do you have more confidence is to reveal the system that you're operating in. And I used these quadrants that Kat Coppett presented at the um, AIN conference in Irvine a couple years ago. And I'm gonna put them up on the screen so you see them. 
So there's two axes in this, in this slide. There's two concepts in here. There's a concept of having a low sense of belonging to having a high sense of belonging, and a concept of having a low value on uniqueness and a high value on uniqueness. I'm actually gonna take the slide away so that everyone's not just reading it, because I want you, whoops. Sorry guys, there we go. All right, back to me. All right, so the two axes, and what I did is I, I didn't show them that slide. I'm showing you that slide so you can see like what this is gonna map into. What I did is I gave everybody a card that looked like this. So people got a paper card that looked like this. And then I had signs on the wall. And I had a sign on the back of the wall that said low sense of belonging. And I had a sign at the front of the room that said high sense of belonging. And I had, I defined what that was. So a low sense of belonging feeling like I don't belong here, right? Other people belong here, but I don't. There is an in-group, I'm not part of it. High sense of belonging, I feel like I belong here and I am part of the in-group. And I had people just physically walk back and forth in the room and not to stop where they felt was true for them, but just to, like, just to pass through where felt was true for them. And then when they had that like, barometer in their gut, then they would mark on their paper where that was. Then I did the same thing for this axis of a sense of my uniqueness is valued. So what makes me special? What makes me different? My culture, my heritage, my perspectives, my opinions, my, my race, my gender, all everything that makes me unique as a human is that, do I feel like that is valued within this group or do I feel like that is actually a point that makes me excluded from this group or, or is not valued, is actively rejected? So they walked that access. So they walk, they feel it, they feel it, they figure out where it is, and then they mark that on their card. Then we do a little, like, how do you cross these axes? And what you end up is, okay, where is their current state at the cross? So they'd end up in one of those four quadrants. And if you, saw, if you memorize that slide, the four quadrants were inclusion, which is both of those measures are high, exclusion, both of those measures are low, assimilation, meaning high sense of belonging, but you have to sacrifice or hide some of your uniqueness, or differentiation, which is like tokenism. High sense of your uniqueness is valued, but you're not, you don't belong. So, so they, they got to see where they ended up. And then um, we also, I did the same thing as that uh, gap slide, or there was, it was renamed here in the chat. But the gap slide where I had them say, okay, if this plays out the way it seems to be going for six months, where are you going to end up? Where are you? And they walked both the axes. Where's your default? So they could define where is their default future. And where, and then also ask them, where do you want to be in six months? Right? And then that's also kind of a test of people, are people understanding this? Because presumably they'll be high on both axes and they'll be both up in the top corner. So they don't write their names on this. They just have this in their hand. It just has a star, a cross, and a dot. And then I have them put the card by their side and then just swap, 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 swap cards with like five other people until now you're holding a card that's not yours. And then I have them hold that card and then they map, the whole group maps themselves in the room. So now you're standing for somebody else who's in this room. And then it becomes an empathy exercise. And I made it and I definitely like make that real for people. Like you're standing for someone, what would have someone stand here? Where are they going? Well, you know, where's their default future? What might have someone in this group be answering the way they answered here? And it be, it's, uh, yes, Carolyn, yeah, it's confidential, it's an anonymous, and it's the people who are in that room. There are people in all four quadrants. So it was very powerful Then we did different conversations there. We had them walk to the default future of their person. They talked with the people in there to be like, okay, what would have, where'd your person come from? You know, what is the pattern that's happening here? And then sometime in the, in the desired future. And then at the end, you collect the cards <laughs> because do never leave your data in the room, <laughs> even if it's anonymized, because people will say they'll give you the cards back, but they won't. You don't, if you at all can get your stuff back, take photos of anything. So they collect the cards and then you can plot that stuff and give that data back to your client. Mm. So if there is a big gap between, I'll show you for a different quadrant exercise, an example. Erica, how long does that, how long does this typically take? 
It depends on how much time you spend having those meaningful conversations while people are standing in the quadrants, right? So, um, but if you just want to like get that data, maybe 15 minutes, 10 minutes, you have to really make sure people understand how to do the quadrants and how to mark them. Let me see if I can show you. But the point is that it's a meaningful activity to be doing and you're getting the data. I'm gonna show you, so here's two other quadrants. I think you can see this. Someone mentioned psychological safety. So those two axes in Amy Evanson's work are about accountability. How, how strongly do you feel like you're accountable for the, the um, success of this team as a team? And how safe does this feel like a team where everyone can share without fear of, um, of like pushback, something backward? Um, same thing, it generates four quadrants. It's another kind of measure that you can't just ask people because you're gonna, you know, you're gonna put people on the spot and you're not gonna get real answers. And so I did that same one and I'll show you an example from a, a client. This is where they were current. This is where they wanted to be desired. And then this is where their default future was. And you could see how it like, it lines up on kind of those extremes, right? They're either going to, ap in this case, they're going to apathy or they're going to performance. And in some, one, when I was really ambitious about this, I took a client and I made like little movies that showed all the dots like moving around. You know? <laughs> so you can really get into that. Um, this was the quadrants we did at Stony Brook. We put the importance of implementing all the stuff we just taught to you and your confidence in your ability to implement. We did the same thing, asked the same questions, people plotted. I made a little key here of these blobs, these things that look like a disease all over the slide. Those are like the answers of different um, amounts. And so you see a lot of people in high importance, low confidence and high importance, high confidence. And a few people who are like, why am I in this session? Maybe one person, <laughs> like, this is not important. <laughs> so that's that, let me check the time. I, and then I'll tell you one, I'm gonna present one other way to do this. If you're dealing with a system, and I just did this at a retreat where you want to get a snapshot of where everybody is. You want everybody to see this snapshot and you can ask questions that are, and you're mindful of the questions are not too, re, are, um, people are going to be able to answer honestly and it's going to be meaningful for them to answer. You can do this activity called constellations. And one way to get good questions is to work with the team and make sure that they're the questions they want that everyone answered. And the way this works, you put something in the center of the room that represents complete agreement or alignment with whatever you're asking them about. I think I can pin my video and then you'll see me. Ah, there we go. I got the controls back. All right. So you put something in the center of the room and that represents just a physical thing. And you're like this, you know, this, this coffee cup represents com or a candle or whatever represents complete agreement. And then you have everyone just walk around and then you read a neutrally worded statement like, um, I have, I am clear what my role is in this project. And people walk around and then they stand, however, in proximity to that central object to the degree they feel like that is true for them. So you kind of establish the boundaries. It's really the same as like zero to 10 scale, but it's physically in the body. It's called constellation, so it seems cool. And like you get, and it's more organic looking because people are just radiating out from that center point. If you wanted to collect data, you could have people put a dot, like a sticker dot on the floor, and later you could take a photo or measure or whatever you want, or you just have people physically there. And what I do with this one is go and stand next to someone, and they've answered, and then next to, not like this, like why do you answer this, but next to them, and you just say, why are you standing where you're standing? And they'll answer, they'll give a sentence. And then the second question I ask is, what does it feel like to be here? And they might say, they might be way on the outside and they might say, fine. And so it really shows the team how much they don't know about how people are really feeling. Like it really is great for revealing how much people make up stories. And it gives you kind of a snapshot of like, of those kind of questions. How aligned are we about this? Um, I have what the resources I need to complete this. Whatever question that you can ask that it's okay to ask the whole group because there's no place not to stand. Right, unlike the cards, like there's, you have to stand somewhere. All right, so those are my two 
because those are the two things I wanted to share with you. I'm gonna, um, any questions before I send you in a breakout room to see, to just talk about what you, um, how you might use this or other ideas that might come to you about how to collect data in the room. All right, it's breakout room time. You may or may not be with the same person you were with before. Probably not. And uh, you'll have a great time. So, oh, look, you're going to be in with the same people. You are going to be with the same people. There you go. <laughs> you should be going now. Not a single. So we're, uh, we're getting Nancy in. She's going to do the next section. I see her eyeballs here. Um, but Nancy, I'm going to just take some sharing out of the last breakout rooms while you get oriented. So anyone have okay. any things to share out of your conversations or just questions? I have something to share. This is Melissa. I have something to share. I was typing it into the chat and then I got booted into the breakout room. I had a something uh, when you're standing next to somebody in a constellation or the quadrant mapping, or I guess it's the constellations, um, I would suggest rather than asking, why are you standing here? A, mod a slight modification to the language to say, to start with a what statement rather than a why statement. You know, what made you decide to stand here? Something like yeah. that, because why can, uh, as, as Jim in my group said, it, it can lead, have a sort of a finger pointing kind of a, a reaction from people. Yes, and it's funny, almost always I do not have why questions for that exact reason. And I have found that maybe it's something about physically, yes, you can change the question to be what has you standing here? And it will, it will, it will do that, it will neutralize that. And I've also found that some, maybe it's something about the fact that you're physically standing and there's sort of like a, maybe it's my tone of the curiosity that why actually seems to work for this particular exercise. But you're right, for best practices, you know, what has you standing here? What has you being here? Yeah, so I'm gonna tell me about your choice. Yeah, it's not even a choice, right? It's just like a, what, what it's truth, you know? What, what has you being here? Um, I was excited I could use poll everywhere. Oh, Doug is saying you can use poll everywhere for quadrants, that's awesome. Yeah, so yeah. you could do this electronically. So you could have people, and that might be even more efficient, right? Have them physically walk it, and then they put the numbers in, and then they end up, although they wouldn't necessarily have the cards to, to swap around. Anyway, you can, combining these technologies is very exciting. Something I've done with groups is what I call a spectrum, which is like what you were talking about. Um, and I start with just something easy, like how long have you been with the organization? So they see that dynamic. And which is interesting and can uh, promote conversation. And where are you now with communication, if that's the topic? And where do you want to be? And what I, so what I'm thinking now is doing that and then continuing with something that might be a little more difficult to talk about with the anonymous way. And I really like what you're saying, Erica, about them walking the spectrum so that it's embodied and then they mark on their cards. Um, yeah. Yeah, I guess this is all a step up from there's just a sort of get to know you type of things, right? Where you assign to the core, you, this is another sort of a thing I learned from AIN, like, oh, cat versus dog people. And you define the, you know, people line up across a corner, across the corners of the room. And then the next question you ask like the opposite corners of the room. So everyone has to move. So if you're asking them like, you know, whatever questions you're asking to just warm them up to physically answering questions. Yeah, and, and to your point about the constellations or that kind of spectrum thing, I told them ahead of time, I'm only going to ask you these two questions and I'm not going to ask you any more questions. And we did it just to like, I put a lot of framing around that activity before we did it. So people knew that they weren't, it wasn't going to go further than that. You know, they knew they were going to be asked to honesty to this point. And then, yeah, anyway, any other comments? Quadrant design might be, yeah, I, sorry. I, yeah. I, lo I love this, it's a, gr it's a great exercise. It's visceral, as you said, you get data that you can use to show your stakeholders who are spending money what you're working on. And if you put up that quadrant where there's 
high importance and low confidence, what a great driver to do more work. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And if you collect these cards and then you graph them, you go back to your client with those graphs. And then if, you know, you work with them for six months and then you can redo this and then see and then show like, okay, what are those results? You know, what's happened? And all of these things are just questions. They're all of these are inquiries. Like, okay, what might have changed? What didn't change? You know, it's all in the service of, of trying to tease out as Carolyn could probably give us a, Carolyn or Nancy, this is actually the, the segue to Nancy, about that curiosity of like, what is? Let's be curious, what is? What's here? What are the biases? What's affecting us? What's affecting the humans? And how we can use data to, to open up conversations of patterns that previously were not visible. Nancy, yeah, it's your thing. segment. Yeah, okay, sorry, yes? Uh, I think sometimes when people are struggling in any relationship, it's hard to, to really define what a great future looks like. Mm -hmm. And I imagine probably part of this is if they're in very low confidence to talk about what does it mean to be in high confidence? What does a team look like? So maybe then helping them define that future might make it easier for them to think about where they are and where they aren't. Yes, I just did a, a re team retreat two days ago and I used images. So I have all these images out there and have them just to give them a little talk about like letting go of your thoughts about it, letting go of your left brain and just, we, we did a visualization exercise about what the future looks like and then having them just go instinctively pick a photo that matches the sense of how the team would be operating in the future. And then they pick a photo of like, what's this in silence? And then it pick a photo of the sense of what this team would be operate is operating about now. And then we started putting words to those first future, then there. And then I'll see if I can, uh, I'll pull up a photo of that. This is a really powerful exercise. Another way to like get people sort of into the sense of it without just being like, well, what's it going to be like? And what's the number? And, you know, like, how do we get people? I think it's part of what we can do, right, is have all these activities that have people access a part of their wisdom that's sort of squirreled away in their bodies and in their images and their intuition. And bridges. Paul wants to talk about bridges. All right, Nancy, I'm going to stop talking because you're brilliant and we all want to hear from you. Blech. No. Um, hello, Ella. It's nice to see some familiar, all of your names are familiar, and uh, and it's really nice to be here. My apologies for being a little late. Uh, what better word, what better sentence to segue into a discussion with fellow AINers than access a different part of our wisdom. And, you know, part of why data collection is important to me, as I've shared with Erica and, and, Car and Carolyn and others, is to not only elevate the status of our, uh, of our prof profession and give us uh, more validity as well as more business and, and uh, uh, help us greatly, but it gives us a, a, an opportunity to reflect not just who's in the room, but who, how we facilitate, how we understand that data. So I've been tasked with um, a couple things here in the next few minutes. I'm going to talk to you about two different studies that uh, I've been privileged to be a part of. One is the social anxiety uh, lowering study with uh, one of Canada's largest uh, research-based um, uh, hospitals and universities, and that's been going on since 2016. And then a recent one from 2019 with uh, a local workforce employment board, and we have used direct applied improvisation to get people back to work. So both qualitative and quantitative uh, measures with those two projects. Uh, the first one is the Youth Wellness Center at St. Joseph's Healthcare. And uh, as I say, since 2016, we have been uh, doing a 12-week improv boot camp to, uh, it's a bit of exposure therapy, and we have uh, with our group, inner city youth that are tasked with uh, uh, the inclusion and the communication and the collaboration of building ensemble. That is what we do, which is code for uh, resiliency and uh, by making, by yes ending, by uh, employing the, the science of neuroplasticity and changing their mindset and forcing them to focus focus on the other, make your partner look good, and being deeply and playfully mindful 
in the moment in an improv exercise. Uh, these individuals who are afflicted with anxiety disorder, and I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it, it can be truly debilitating. The, uh, it gives them the opportunity to, by focusing on the other, not having the time, energy, or inclination to worry about their uh, self-centered selves. And I say that with love and kindness, you know, deeply, uh, the anxiety is, um, as you know, we talk about building not just a safe place, but a brave place. And that is, and as Keith Johnstone said, you know, with yes, we are rewarded with the adventure that we will take. With no, we are rewarded with the security we retain. And it is in that uh, retaining the security that solidifies and tells these individuals who are afflicted with anxiety disorder that they're safe for if they don't, safer if they don't. Improv is a wonderful tool to counteract those cognitive distortions and look at how the stories that they're telling the, themselves in their brain may or may not be true. Um, I am happy to share our research protocol and the liter literature search and the academic research that's been done uh, through this study, and I'm happy to uh, send it out and share it with you. In this study, we had both qualitative and quantitative measures to it. The quantitative measures is a validated score called GAD generalized anxiety disorder, as well as the self-esteem score. Those were the quantitative measures pre and post. The qualitative measures that we took were a lot of uh, personal interviews and, and reflections and, uh, and uh, sharings that the kids provided us for that. Uh, right now, it's a conference paper. It's not published yet, but, you know, knock on wood, and hopefully, you know, we get to uh, present at some healthcare, um, uh, healthcare conferences around it, and it is, um, and so, what a pleasure. Okay. Next, uh, uh, next study that we, uh, that I did started in, sort of started back in the, in the summer, and uh, in a nutshell, it is uh, using applied improvisation to get people back to work. Um, a local city uh, about an hour and a half away from where I live is London, Ontario. It is uh, a city of around uh, uh, 500,000 people, and they have identified, uh, um, I believe, 14,000 people who are, who are out of work, but uh, identify themselves as wanting to work and people are unemployed for a lot of different reasons whether they are waiting for recall for the factory or mental illness or family or whatever reason you know downsize uh, so they are not in the Canadian welfare system they are identified as wanting to work uh, and not working for a host of reasons the um, the RFP came across my desk through another consulting company, and it, they were asking for a completely new and innovative way to help people leverage their uh, uh, their journey back into employability, because they have been uh, in the workforce world, in that social agency world, they have been uh, tasked with resume writing and interview skills workshops to death. And they do not work. So we put together um, a, a six-week applied improv boot camp, and, uh, and it was based on the research that we did around uh, two things, twofold. What the employers are asking for in employees today, which, as many of you know, are things like uh, communication skills, collaboration skills, empathy skills, you know, that type of uh, adaptability, all of that. And um, I don't have to tell you how well improv is to cultivate those skills. So that's what, so we gave them the skills that the employers are saying they wanted. At the same time, that we are building in them some of the uh, some of the qualities that they are lacking that are making them discouraged to finding work and uh, and those are resiliency and and uh, risk taking and uh, facing those cognitive distortions that again are uh, leaving them defeated in this in this process of looking for work and uh, so it was a pilot project we had um, and we had hard metrics for after six weeks of putting them through this. Uh, those metrics were one of three things. At the end of six weeks, we needed 85% of them to have met one of the three criteria. The first one was that they are 
gainfully employed, that they are back in the workforce, or two, that they are back in school, college, some sort of retraining. They have, uh, through this experience of uh, creativity and improv, perhaps they have identified something else that they wanted to do and, and uh, you know, go back to college for chef or whatever. Or three, interestingly, they have, um, through this process, identified an issue or uh, a challenge where they need uh, professional counseling or help for that. And um, I can tell you that those metrics were met. 60% of them are gainfully employed. We have um, uh, a bunch that are in, in retraining and, um, and uh, the rest are, uh, have identified some issue. Interestingly, at the same time that we were uh, delivering these skills to the unemployed, it was also a scalability study and we were training five facilitators so that they could leverage it forward and continue to use it in their respective social agencies. So we had the... Oh, okay, the Nancy. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Nancy, I'm going to pause yeah. you right there because you just hit a great point and we have like 15 minutes left of the webinar. Okay. Um, you had a great point because you actually, I, even though you weren't on this webinar, you brought us back to that original, this original thing we talked about. Yes. This is low tech guys, but that gap, right? <laughs> so, so, uh, that gap of, I don't know, could you see that of, of what were those original client goals? And she defined exactly. it as 85% of the participants will be one of these three things. So there was right. that concrete, this is what it matters in the eyes of the client. So I think it's a great time to send people back into the breakout rooms for your last five minutes to talk with each other. Unless, Nancy, there's another jewel you want them to take well, in. Well, I was going to um, do, I, I started at 10, or I started at like five after. I had like a couple minutes to do the uh, anxiety study, the employability study, and then some of the bias that comes in when study. But if you want to do breakouts and come back, we can totally talk about that after, Eric. Well, Whatever you want. Let's, let, let's do, should we discuss a little bias, which might be relevant as well. Okay. To the breakout um, rooms. I'll stop. I'll I'll uh, um, I'll cut short the employability study and give you an acronym, friends. Chore, C H O R E. The following five are the most common uh, research biases that come into uh, the type of study that I've done and many others do. Um, in in essence, it's it stands for cultural bias, the halo effect. I did this notes. Hang on. Um, uh, the order of our questions in the qualitative, the, uh, the order in which we ask questions, the uh, researcher bias, also known as confirmation bias, and the elaboration of, uh, of the questions that we ask as well. Because when we, um, much like, I think it was Melissa who talked about, um, you know, why are you standing in this space as opposed to, um, you know, uh, tell me more about your choice or I wonder, you know, coming from a coming from a place of curiosity and positivity opens up a conversation in a, in a much more true and authentic way. And uh, very often facilitation does that. It, it, for traditional facilitation is supposed to lead and direct and applied improvisation as, you know, is um, it that type of traditional facilitation can really lead to that type of bias. So the cultural bias, to go back to our acronym, cultural bias is how we understand and we look at things through our filter of our, uh, of our own bias. The halo effect is that which we have when, you know, we view someone because of one particular positive trait, we view them to be more knowledgeable and uh, um, and we receive them better because of because of that. Um, the order of our questions in the in the questionnaire that you're giving your workshops. Careful how that becomes um, a leading, you know. And uh, confirmation bias, researcher bias, is that when we have a hypothesis, we look for evidence to make it so. And oh my God, am I ever guilty of that? But that is just the truth and then the and then the elaboration of our questioning you know uh, uh as i said before how, watch how our questioning can um uh, put words in people's mouths and we don't want that you know we truly need uh who they are truthfully coming so sure and i'll send that out too over to you air that is awesome 
isn't this exciting? <laughs> Questions, <laughs> data, it's so exciting because, you know, you get, it just sends us into more um, distinction about our thinking and inquiry and curiosity. I know that this is not enough. We are going to send you into breakout rooms to maximize <laughs> your chance to talk to each other. And we'll be back with Nancy and Carolyn in five minutes. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Hello, hey. everybody. Hi, uh, welcome back, all. Yeah, so we did have a question in here, like, what if, what if we want to ask leading questions? And I think the main right. thing is we definitely want to be aware if we are asking leading questions. And ideally, I think we do want to be mindful and careful about that because it's like the quintessential leading question in, in my line of work is the professor asking a lecture room full of students, do you understand? And all of the students going, right. when they don't. So it, it, like, if, if we do want to, again, not fool ourselves, I think it is important to be, if, we, if, we're, if we're doing it with design, that's one thing, but mm -hmm. it's very, very easy to ask a leading question just yes, to, the, get, to reinforce the confirmation bias. Yeah, the equivalent in my world might be, this happened, there's a leadership team, I had people answer questions, I, uh, not, you know, on an online form, I present the results, it's been two months later, I, it took two months to get the meeting, I present the results, and the leader is like, oh, wow, you know, these are from like two months ago, I think everything's so much better now, I, I can understand why they used to look like that, but everything's, you know, now things are really good, total silence in the room, so I'm like, you know, uh -huh. would you be interested in finding out? And they're like, and I'm like, take out a piece of paper, number your paper one to 10. We asked the same questions right there in the room. Then I took those questions home, replotted the graph. They hadn't moved at all, you know? So that was like, how do I, you know, that was a way to like use data to reveal the system to the person. If they're in power, they're going to get biased answers. Not a single person spoke up, but then I brought the data back. So. So interesting. Any, any other uh, yeah, so client? Com, we have a couple minutes. Yes. Yeah. So, 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 practicing what we preach, we ha I put a feedback form into the chat room. If you can please fill that out very quickly. You know, you can pick and choose the questions. That would be great. So we can get some more feedback. This has really been a great start. I feel <laughs> to a conversation. There is. So it is indeed a start. More, what more do you um, want? We could get into so. Yeah. Um, Nancy's um, going to put into put in uh, put together a summary of her second study and add it to a shared Google Drive that we will send out. It's a little bit proprietary. I'll get the uh, permission from a client and I'll I'll send it out in generic form. But if you want to have a conversation with me about it, um, feel free to reach out and I can uh, and we can uh, do so in more depth. Yes, I'll share the slide here real quick of the other activity I was describing, where using images and then putting words to images, and then people individually giving actions, and then dot voting about priorities and themes. So there's that. I'll so just give you a quick snapshot. What else do we I have? look forward to watching oh, the breakout rooms. rooms. The Zoom want... account, these breakout rooms, it's a free part of anyone's Zoom account. So we can continue using breakout rooms. Yeah, Thank you so much. To... This was really helpful. All of it. Thank you for your presentation. We have two whole minutes. Do you want to tell us what was helpful, David? Please. Oh, just thinking about as Cedric and I were talking in the breakout room, um, just the importance of like one of the things he talked about is how do we get compliance from our client? And the meta thing for me today is I can't wait to talk with a specific client that I talked with him about of what more another conversation checking in on hopes and dreams and then what are measure what are outcomes and then how can we measure that mm -hmm. and working with her so that there's more chance of a compliance if she helped you know do that with me um, yeah. yeah that's so I, I have a note that's from so Paul. Important. it's so it's yeah it's it's us walking our talk of co-creation right and using our skills um i'm sending it back to paul to close us Thank you, Erica, and thank you very much, Carolyn, and latterly, Nancy. And thanks to everybody for their contributions and the chat, the breakout rooms, and speaking to the group. The recording will stop in a couple of seconds, and then we can say what we really think.